So I'm uh, Dr. Andrew Zalkotitayenko, a former, well, former theoretical physicist, former head of Ukrainian Space Agency, former president, uh, vice president of Agriculture Aerospace, which was Spaceport Canada, and many, many other things. But I'm in business of my own since 2003. I run software company, which also provides quite a bit of consulting on Ukrainian affairs, on due diligence mainly, and uh, on business arrangements in Ukraine, just because of my background. Involvement started in, uh, in February of 89 and it was only beginning everything USSR was in place everything was as it was and then I uh, actually me uh, my wife and me went to help Vladimir Yuvarivsky and then I was uh, through this campaign to bringing him to first Soviet parliament we got involved into the whole Ruch story uh, I was secretary of Ruch uh, for Kyiv election campaign for uh, 1990 and then uh, then I was when Ukraine became independent which we were clearly involved because uh, you know participation at all levels uh, we were among very few people who were uh, under uh, uh, the parliament in, 19, in 91 during the coup and other things like that and then I was basically recruited into government because I knew English there was huge shortage of people and I had some uh, management experience I was secretary of council on physics of metals of big Soviet Academy so I, I kind of knew how to manage involved projects and then uh, for a few years I was uh, involved in uh, just management, basically building the government, building space agency. I was involved in nuclear uh, deterrent negotiations and made, made my way, my, my contribution. And then uh, it happened that I had some disagreements with Leonid Kuchma and one of us had to go, so I uh, went to Canada and I'm here in Canada since 96. Uh, so, and uh, naturally I supported, I supported your Maidan, the usual things that we do here. I think uh, that he had practically unlimited trust like Yushchenko in 2004. He could do big changes. Instead of that, yes, we had war. This is, this is a good excuse and this explanation why not everything works. But nothing, practically nothing was done to defeat corruption. This is my fundamental problem with him. I don't, well, there can be ideological differences, left, right, but corruption has to be defeated. It's impossible to do anything in Ukraine until corruption is there. Well, we Ukrainian people who came from there, we understand this beast, we understand how to handle it, but not many people like us are ready to go there. So, and this issue of corruption is a big problem. And I think that, you know, as we used to say in the 90s, that electorate is genius. It always makes right choice. So we have, uh, he came with 55% support, now it is 17, which is below Yanukovych level in uh, just before Maidan. So probably something is really wrong there. First of all, judiciary. Because you can build as many committees and as many organizations as you want, but if at the end of the day, People come to the court, which is not independent, which can judge whatever uh, in favor of somebody who pays more. It all makes no sense. It just becomes another venue of collection of bribes, and that's all. They have actually they have in Odessa, they have in Kharkiv. It's it's progressing well, and it's good step, but it's first step because it starts from police, and it's not all police, it's just uh, the patrol police, which was an uh, irritating factor, because they were collecting bribes for nothing. But uh, you have to, do, have to go up, up the ladder, and finally you have to have 
independent court, you have to have independent judiciary, and then everybody will win, you know, everybody will win. It seems that if I have my pocket court, I'll be fine. But when power will change, it will not be fine. I will not say that it is mentality. It's a matter of convenience. If people can play honestly, they will always play honestly. I know this. I've seen the situation when, uh, well, myself, I had the situations when you can give bribe and you cannot give bribe. And in the case, if you can go honest, sincere, uh, correct way, you always go correct way. And I think my, my solution to this, uh, my recommendation would be to have elections of judges. Or at least to have jury, which is really randomly selected, preferably by computer. Because, and it will not be fast. You will not do it today for tomorrow. It will take probably five years, but it has to be election of qualified. You can have five, six qualified persons who are pre-screened, who have all credentials. And you run elections and you have the procedure of recalling them. And then it probably in two or three cycles it will work, finally. Because even now, there are honest judges. Some of them were killed during Janukovic times, but there are honest judges even now. So it's not, not completely rotten. I will uh, give a quotation from Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore president, uh, recently deceased, who said that they will believe that you fight corruption when you will imprison three your close friends. He has to start, he has to show the example. No, no other way, no other way. Because you cannot, you know, you cannot be half honest, half corrupt. You have to be either honest or corrupt. That's my, my opinion. So he can do lots of things right now without even doing election of judges. I will not, there, there are some parliamentarians in his fraction who are, who don't belong to the parliament and who are there only for immunity and to, to wear the badge. And there are uh, many things that can be done by president if he wants, really wants to stop corruption. I would say, uh, first thing, you know, give management of Lipetsk uh, uh, confectionery to somebody. Don't uh, get profits from there. Come on, you are president of the biggest European country, and you take, uh, well, it is probably 100 millions per year turn around of that, 100 to 150, as far as I remember. But you are president of the biggest European country with glorious history, which is key. You know, as in that fairy tale, when the egg and the needle in the egg and the tip of the needle, and all, which is a key to European stability and to destruction, final destruction of Russian Empire. And you go around counting these profits. Well, probably he has like $10 million profit from Lipetsk uh, before taxes, and then I don't know. But it is not the thing for the person who has total estate about $2 billion and increasing when Ukraine is in crisis. Well, it's not a thing. He has to do something about this. He has to divorce from all foreign properties. He has to divorce from business, really. Not, not legally, formally, but really divorce from this. And this, then it will be a good example and it will stop the process. And curing the process, it has to be done from inside. It will not work like in Georgia. Georgia is small. Georgia is, total population of Georgia is uh, Kiev with Kiev region. That's all. That's whole Georgia. And they had two wars, by the way. And, two. Uh, so, and there you can do it manually, sort of manually. You know that this, this and this guy are corrupt. In Ukraine, with 42 million population, it has to be self-cleaning system. And I see self-cleaning only as judicial proper judicial services. He is delaying as long as he can delay, I think. So I'm saying that something happens to people when they get there. So they, they lost control of their self. Maybe it's psychological evolution of people who 
feel that they can do everything. Yeah, they can, they can give any order, but it doesn't mean that it will be done. Uh, there is lots of sm uh, smartness in the parliament, but not a lot of culture. By all means, there are people who, there may be 10, maybe 15 people who are more than two times parliamentarians, who understand how the system works, who understand the importance of doing everything right and all other things. And other, well, people came from all walks of life. It will take some time until they will realize that it, does, it is not a way to do this. And same with Saakashvili and Avakov, you know, Armenian, Georgian, one claims that uh, Armenian is stealing money, Armenian, it's not proven, there, there is corruption on the, on the Vakov side. But uh, the specific case of Saakashvili by Saakashvili was not proven, and it comes and comes and comes. Saakashvili is, in a way, pain in the neck for all people in the government. Deers need the wolf in the forest, so they need somebody like that. I, I will not be very happy if he will uh, become, so say, prime minister, because uh, Georgian experience is dual. From one side, he has suppressed corruption, and he have, but not not at all levels. At the very high level, there there was quite color corruption, and. Uh, this was good. From another hand, he have lost his nerve during uh, Russian invasion several times, and he went through prime ministers like through pampers. You know, five or six prime ministers during very short time. One of them killed at the beginning. So uh, I am not sure that this is the right choice as prime minister. But he, he is definitely useful. He is not letting them to sleep. He is divider. He is not uniter and he is divider. And I am concerned about this. We have what I know from my contacts. It's not proven anywhere, but uh, what I know from my contacts is that a uh, new Russian agenda for Ukraine is uh, division. Conflicts, seeding internal conflicts, division, and basically bringing Ukraine back to ruin a state when everybody fights everybody. And in this situation, we maybe this is wrong. You know, I, I have no, I didn't see the decree of Putin about this or anything. But uh, there are uh, facts that confirm this concept that we are talking about division of Ukraine, that new name of new Russian uh, game is not Novorossiya, which failed. Uh, it is div dividing Ukraine. Division, internal conflicts, disorder. In the case of Avakov and Saakashvili, these things should not happen at all. It's not the place. The President's uh, Council for Reforms is not the place to discuss somebody's corruption. There is a state attorney, there is SBU, there is police, file. From another hand, it's not uh, proper to react this way as Avakov did. It's not. You don't do this. You came here not to uh, express your emotions or your opinion. You came here to work on reforms. Work on reforms. And then if you have problems, go somewhere outside and solve your problems. I know how, as Bismarck said, you know, there are two things that you should never watch. How sausages are made and how laws are made. Well, so I was involved in several budget processes. Uh, I've seen how it's done from inside. I can say that she's doing well as Minister of Finances. Maybe some things would, should have been done differently. Because uh, my opinion is that you have to develop not, uh, you have to develop taxation base, and then you will have more money coming into Treasury and other things. I think, you know, Diaspora is doing well. It's not really organized, but nothing is really organized in the Ukrainian community here or there. <laughs> well, but uh, I think Diaspora is helping, I think government was helping, and they know many people who are, who just don't go anywhere, they just send money to Ukraine, and that's all. And it hardly, hardly can be accounted somehow, but I think diaspora, uh, diaspora have done its, past its half of, of the way. Well, but uh, it's always, can, always more can be done.
there is no question. But I think that we should not be ashamed about this. Diaspora started uh, for, for Ukraine. There was such Canadian group for democracy in Ukraine established, and I was among its founders. It was, if I am not mistaken, 2011 or 12, long before everything started there. So we are involved, definitely. And we do what we can do. It's changed tremendously. Ukrainians, well, thanks to Putin, Ukrainians feel themselves as one nation. No matter what language, no matter what uh, what's happening, it's one nation. And I, I've seen statistics of, pub, of public opinion, public polling. Uh, the it, uh, change was dramatic. Before, before Maidan, uh, Russia had about 50, 50 to 60 percent positive uh, response. After uh, Crimea, it was six percent. Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians united. There were, uh, there was separation in Donbas. It will be wrong to say that Donbas is just occupied. No, they, there are pro-Russian people in Donbas, but they are exposed to overpowerful weapon of mass uh, fooling or mass destruction to Russian TV. But overall, it, it was great. No, there will be no Maidan in Moscow. There will be coup. Uh, I don't, there was, uh, there were, from what I remember, there were mass protests in Moscow uh, for, uh, in 89, in 88, but most of these people are gone, emigrated. So I don't believe in Moscow Maidan. I believe in economy, in the problems in economy and some kind of removal of Putin by uh, ruling elite. This is what I think will happen. Uh, some of Russian uh, writers said that in Russia monarchy is limited only by killing the monarch. Maybe Medvedev, but he will not be the real ruler. It's, you know, there is a problem, the fight between business and KGB, or successors of KGB, security. And logically speaking, next should be from business side. And from business side, the most obvious a candidate is Medvedev, but let's see what will happen. Oligarchs, but there are oligarchs who come from uh, KGB side to to keep it all together, and there are oligarchs who come from commerce. And now uh, the whole agenda is run by KGB oligarchs. Putin himself is quite quite rich person, so. I don't think that there may maybe he will. Uh, well, if I could give him advice, I would say that he must put the blame on his Silaviki and get out from the problem. This is a way for him to preserve himself. There are several aspects to, to involvement in Syria. First of all, we need to understand one thing: that uh, this ISIS or Caliphate, as it's now, Islamic Caliphate, is established by Sunni from uh, Iraq. And the Sunni from Iraq are former people of Saddam Hussein. So it is Ba'ath Party, which had close ties with the Communist Party of Soviet Union. And there are definitely ways of communication between Moscow and Raqqa, which is capital of Caliphate. Uh, this first thing. Second, it is practically, well, there is a lot of indications that oil which is coming from Khalifat is going to uh, Bashar Assad and then export. So this means that Russia basically is taking under control this oil venue. But I don't think that it is that simple because Russia got into conflict with 1.5 billion of Sunni Muslims by bombing uh, the pro-Western opposition. 
and this will, will backfire. I don't think that uh, Kremlin really understands where he got into, how deep he got into, because uh, almost 100% of Russian uh, Muslims are Sunni as well. And uh, Putin had to give back to Chechnya oil refinery, take it from his KGB friends and get it back to oil company. And uh, Tatarstan uh, is uh, declaring the intents. Uh, it's not declaring, but it's moving towards independence. And Tatarstan is very important for Russian economy. It's not Chechnya, which is just a trouble. Tatarstan is very important. So I think that this engagement in Syria uh, starts to destabilize Russia inside. That can, can be the case. We will see what will happen. And we will see how uh, economy, Russian economy will sustain the load of two, uh, two wars in uh, Donbass and in uh, Syria. And now they are getting into Yemen. So it will be three. We'll see how it will go, but uh, I think it was a stupid move. It, yes, it diverted the attention from Ukraine, and it uh, was sort of as bargaining chip with the West to be admitted to grown-up table again. But they uh, the key again screwed it up, and now he have nothing but trouble there. I'm not con completely uh, say divorced from this issue because I was involved in disarmament and Budapest memorandum and other things. Well, and I can tell you that there was no other way, no way out, because we had. Well, we, we can talk about this later. But why do you think uh, Russia has sanctions? Because Americans love Ukraine? No. It's enforcement of Budapest Memorandum, first of all. We gave then, in 94, we created the conditions when they will, uh, they didn't use military force. But it is 21st century and we are dealing with nuclear power. But they imposed destructive sanctions. So I think it was not complete waste with Budapest Memorandum, that's my opinion. Also, you know, if you talk, talk back to that memorandum, the thing is that we cannot, uh, could then, we could not uh, do anything. There was tremendous pressure from US. Uh, you know, when they came first after, after independence, the suggestion of Deputy State Secretary was, why don't you deal with us through Moscow? I expected to see American paratroopers on our border with Moscow next morning. No. Well, and uh, we did not have the way to produce nuclear fuel. This means that Ukraine, if we did not go for exchange of warheads on fuel, which worked for 10 years, we would have lost half of uh, electricity in Ukraine. In, uh, say, it was, it was by New Year that year. So that's why uh, we had no choice. Basically, we had no choice. And thanks to Yushchenko and to Timoshenko and that post-Maidan government, we have now uh, ability to get fuel from the West. Because we have in Ukraine, we have production of uranium. We have the first stage of enrichment. Then it goes to Kazakhstan, then from Kazakhstan to Russia, and comes back. And we also supply some materials for fuel roads. And now this can be done by Western Gauss. So we have uranium ore, we have yellow cake, and we, we can, all the rest can be done for us by Western Gauss, which is great. It's tremendous achievement. Well, but that, uh, that time it was not the case. That time we were in the situation when uh, deputy, uh, this minister of cabinet of ministers, it's a person who basically manages the operation of the government. He had to sign a special permit to get two, uh, two and a half liters of gas to pick somebody from Borisov. There was nothing. We were left with nothing by our Russian, whatever, whom they are. So uh, I would not say that uh, the best memorandum is not enforced. It's just enforced in 21st century way. 
not in the 20th century. Right? It depends on patience of Russian people, which is unlimited by definition. But I think that uh, I would say year, a year, looking at their corporations and conditions of their corporations, because you know the thing is that without access to Western uh, financial resources, he has to deplete whatever is left in his reserves, or his corporations will face margin call, and they will be taken over, and he don't want this. So we, I think a year, the way how, is, how he's going, a uh, year. Russian railways have uh, good relations with Bombardier, and Rosneft has uh, packages in Alberta. So they, naturally, there, was, there were lobbyists in Canada who prevented sanctions, I think so. I want to tell, say one thing, which is, I think many people omitted, including Yeriska. Uh, when Soviet Union collapsed, we had lots of Western experts coming to Soviet Union, to Ukraine, I was handling tasks then, and they were telling that you are breadbasket of Soviet Union, and we came to help with agriculture and other things. It was part true, but the whole truth was that it was arsenal of Soviet Union, and there are still, and that Western companies who understand this, they uh, they are successful. Western girls are successful in Ukraine because they work with high tech with machine building, with aviation. You see, the best rockets in the world are made in Ukraine, best transport planes in the world are made in Ukraine. And this is where we have to develop cooperation. Because it is, it's not, you know, investing in Ukraine, into corrupt Ukraine, sinking $200 million, uh, which will just disappear. No, it's creating joint ventures and uh, building and creating new products together. Production can be in Nigeria or can be in Canada or can be elsewhere. It's not important. It's important to bring intellectual potential to action. And we had the project which was sponsored by Canada, which was Science and Technology Center in Ukraine. My last project was working with some, someone, uh, was a Stab Havaleshka from Winnipeg. And this was the idea that even technological secrets are not a problem. We have to keep to save brains. And we in Ukraine succeeded to do this. Ukraine now is third or fourth, uh, fourth or fifth exporter of software. And this seemed to pass by our Canadian look at Ukraine. Because it is, it is corrupt, but it's, poten it's a country with great intellectual potential. That's, that's, that's my statement. <laughs> they have to defeat corruption. After corruption is defeated, investments will come in, in a snip, and everybody will benefit, from Poroshenko to uh, people in uh, occupied part of Donbass. Everybody will, everybody will benefit. Because you have, they have to understand that Ukraine is forever. It's not until tomorrow, so we have to grab whatever we can, can and run away to Belize. No. It is, it is forever, so let's get on building it. And everybody will be okay. Uh, well, and in a more practical way, I would say that they have to develop joint ventures with Ukrainian enterprises and watch uh, carefully their books and see what they have protected going to Ukraine. And again, my main point is that they have to use Ukrainian expertise. It's not, you know, it is not like Space Cowboys movie. It's totally different, you know, we have, again, we have very good transport airplanes, engines. Russia, you know, talking about sanctions, Russia have lost uh, supply of Ukrainian engines and they sold uh, their half-built frigates uh, to Vietnam because nobody sells turbines to them. Uh, so this is where you should go. Create joint, joint venture and then you will see. Develop new product using Ukrainian capabilities and then you will see. It's not, not much, you see. There is factory in Kharkiv which makes aggregates for airplanes. 
you don't have to do big investment there. You can invest some, develop new aggregates which will work for CRG, Bombardier, and make it there, bring it here, without building new factory. So you have just to do, do, it, do it smart way, and you can work even in corrupt environment. I think that technology by itself is not important. The brain which created the technology is important. Because if somebody have created one technology, then somebody will create another one. And we in Ukraine, unlike Russia, who have practically lost most of its intellectual potential, we have preserved it to a great extent. That's why we can do things which Russians cannot do. And uh, then if you cannot give people, uh, somebody who from us said that if you cannot give uh, people bread, give them freedom. So give freedom to economy. Give reasonable, not very high taxation and give freedom to economy and uh, it will flourish. Ukrainian software production, uh, software export grew uh, to almost 3 billion per year during very difficult years of Yanukovych, very difficult for business. It was just the area who party of regions could not control. And there are other developments, you know, uh, rocketry, aircrafts, engines, uh, I mean turbines. Ukraine is one of five countries of the world who makes all uh, components of electricity equipment from turbine to transformers, to wires, to everything. So there is, uh, this is where it has, we have to look for it. And if we create, say, joint venture with Ukrainian uh, intellect and uh, Canadian intellect working together, we will definitely find a way to make money from it. That's, that will be done.